seated. This is the time set for argument uh, in NIDA v. GMAC Mortgage, LLC. And I now realize that the uh, motion uh, to file additional authorities was actually in this case rather than in the case we heard this morning. Uh, so everything that I said this morning relates to this case instead. Mr. Chamoff, welcome back. May it please the court, good afternoon. I reserve 10 minutes uh, for rebuttal. Uh, I'm going to do my best not to repeat any of the comments from this morning's session. Uh, my goal is to first provide you with the thoughtful authorities that you requested, uh, then discuss uh, a couple of questions that Justice Brewer had for Mr. Heffernan uh, during his portion of the presentation this morning, uh, then move to a discussion of how these transactions work, which I think would be helpful based on some of the concerns uh, that were heard raised, and then finally uh, address the question that Justice Kissler had about why do we record these assignments anyway? What's, what's the benefit to be gained from it? Uh, to begin with, uh, we would commend four cases to your consideration. Uh, one is Jackson versus Mers. That's a Minnesota Supreme Court case. It's discussed at uh, pages two to five of uh, our brief on the merits. Uh, that case in particular is instructive because it discusses the nature of the interests that are pl at play in transactions like this and how those interests are affected on transfer. Another case is Edelstein versus Bank of New York Mellon. Uh, that is a Nevada case from earlier this year, the Nevada Supreme Court. That is at the bank's brief on the merits in the Brandrup case at pages 22 and 43. Uh, most importantly, however, uh, we bend your attention to two cases from the District of Idaho. And although those are not cases from the Idaho Supreme Court, we commend the Idaho cases to you because Idaho's statute is the statute most closely aligned with Oregon's from a textual standpoint. Uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, or Oregon's statute was originally introduced in 1955 uh, and did not gain traction in Oregon. A modified form of the 1955 legislation was reintroduced in Oregon in 1957 and in Idaho in 1957. Both legislatures passed essentially the same statutes. Oregon's governor vetoed the Oregon legislation, Idaho's governor signed the Idaho legislation. In the 1959 session, Oregon adopted the statute that looks substantially identical to Idaho's and the governor signed it. So uh, although I would like to be able to argue to you that Oregon's statute is based on Idaho's, they appear to be sort of siblings, uh, if not identical twins, at least fraternal twins. Uh, the two cases that we commend to you are O'Banion uh, versus Select Portfolio. Uh, that's on page 43 uh, of our brief. And then a second case uh, that has not been uh, cited in either of the briefs. Uh, the citation to that is 2011 Westlaw 705617. That's findings and recommendations dated October 17, 2011, and the order adopting those findings is at 2012 Westlaw 139213, and that's dated January 17 of 2012. In uh, questions this morning, uh, Justice Brewer uh, asked Mr. Heffernan about the utility of having an analysis of ORS 86.705 sub 1 that substantively, I believe that was Justice Brewer's word, uh, permitted an evaluation of which person was it that really benefited from the deed of trust. And uh, our uh, 
response to that is, is a, in a couple of ways. One, if you approach the statute from a substantive standpoint, looking to see who really benefits instead of the person who is named or designated, then you would necessarily write out named or designated from the statute. You might have the situation in which the trustee said, Mr. Heffernan is the person for who, whose benefit this trustee is given, yet you would have, uh, under a substantive approach, a search for the person who was really uh, the person who was benefiting. Problems with that that include, uh, as the Chief Justice pointed out, you turn every trust deed, which is supposed to be a quick process into a fact-finding process, potentially going outside of the documents themselves. I gave you the situation this morning of a loan in which there were six participants, six lenders. How do you decide between those six which is the one person that under the law is the beneficiary and entitled to certain notices and taking on certain obligations uh, under the statutes. That the same problem would arise many times over when you have a note which, because it's been transferred, syndicated many times over, may have in fact thousands of owners, each having a tiny fractional interest in that note. And uh, as I'll discuss in a moment, the MERS system is set up to address that kind of situation and permit a statutory scheme like the Oregon Trust Deed Act to function under those circumstances. Uh, Justice Brewer asked, what's a nominee? Uh, a nominee is a limited agent. It's a kind of agent. You can use the two terms synonymously. Uh, nominee is most commonly used in Oregon law in transactions involving uh, corporate shares and bailments where there's been an appointment of an agent who has certain duties but not necessarily a wide variety of them. In this case, the selection of the term nominee has sort of two functions. One, by calling MERS the nominee, it calls out, as the statute requires, a naming uh, of MERS as the beneficiary. And second, it's an indication that MERS does not hold all of the interests underneath the security interest. It has legal title to those interests, but the lender still keeps the equitable or beneficial interest. So that's the, the background and the use of the term nominee. Before turning to a description of how the MERS system works and why, uh, it would help to keep in mind that under Oregon law, it's ORS 130.005 subsection 2 paragraph N, trust principles don't apply to the Oregon Trust Deeds Act. So we are dealing only with the strictures of what's in Chapter 86 and not general trust principles. Under the MERS system, MERS is intended to stay the beneficiary through transfers of many lenders' interests. These transactions are set up with the expectation that the lender's interest may change hands many, many times and that the ultimate end recipient for the money in these transactions may very well be Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. If you look at the teeny tiny language toward the bottom of each of the trust deeds and the cases before you, you will see that these are forms prescribed by Freddie and Fannie to accommodate a uniform system and that changes are made as little as possible uh, across the nation to accommodate local laws. This is intended to be a system with many transfers. MERS stays the beneficiary for a couple of key reasons. First, 
the lender is in the business of loaning money and may not want to be in the business of undertaking the obligations of, under, of a beneficiary under a foreclosure scheme. They may very well, as here, choose to hire an agent instead of undertaking those activities themselves. Second, by having one entity, in this case MERS, and it doesn't have to be MERS, it could be any other entity serving this kind of a function, the beneficiary stays the same so that everyone who is involved in the transaction knows where to go to get information. Everyone who is involved in the transaction knows where to send the information. If a notice goes to MERS, MERS can get the information to whichever lender or lenders need to get that information because MERS is serving as the agent for anyone in the process who is a member of the MERS system. To address the specific question that Justice Walters had, when a lender transfers the lender's interest in the note and the trust deed, MERS goes along with that transfer. MERS holds legal title, and if the lender transfers... What do you mean MERS goes along with that title, with that transfer? If, for example, <laughs> Bank of America transfers its interest in the underlying transaction to U.S. Bank, then under the trust deed and under an agreement that those banks have with MERS, MERS will continue to be the beneficiary and will continue to be the agent for the successor in interest to Bank of America. So when U.S. Bank acquires the interest from Bank of America, say, U.S. Bank now has the same trustee that... When you say interest, are you talking, you're talking about the interest under the note and whatever interest they had under the trust deed? Yes, Your Honor. Both? Both, okay. Both. They move together in that yes. sense. Yes. So that the trustee that Bank of America had in its trust deed is now the trustee for U.S. Bank. The beneficiary that Bank of America had is now the beneficiary for U.S. Bank. What do you call what happened between U.S. Bank and Bank of America? Or Bank of America is the one that transferred. What do you call that transfer? A transfer. <laughs> <laughs> and why, why it, is it not an assignment? I, I call it a transfer because that's the terminology that's used under the Uniform Commercial Code, either transfer or negotiation of the underlying uh, promissory note, and uh, we concede that that carries with it uh, the interests in the trustee that secure that note, except to the extent that the parties could would choose to change that by contract. But and why is that not an assignment under 86735? Because an assignment under 86735 is only an assignment of the beneficiaries, MERS, interest not the lender's interests. And if MERS didn't exist, it would, it would be called an assignment. It depend, if MERS didn't exist and the lender was the beneficiary, and the, it then, then yes, that would be an assignment. I mean, to give you an example, let's say Bank of America sells the note uh, with its attendant trustee, their interest in that transaction to the Fourth National Bank of Toledo, Ohio, which is not affiliated with MERS, doesn't want to have MERS as its beneficiary. In that case, MERS would travel with those documents as the trustee would to the Fifth National Bank of Toledo, but the Fifth National Bank of Toledo would most likely say, I don't want you to be my beneficiary anymore and MERS would assign its interest as beneficiary to whomever Fifth Bank of Toledo wanted. That transaction from MERS to the new beneficiary for Fifth Bank of Toledo is what ORS 86.735 sub 1 requires to be recorded. So Mr. Chamoff, then the um, status of MERS as a nominee, a specific form of agent, as you've just described it, uh, presumptively flows to the transferee subject to revocation. 
my words, your concept? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. But the agency persists unless and until it's revoked by a successor of the lender? Yes, Your Honor. And how do we know that? Because let me tell you why. I'm not trying to, trying to be difficult here, but I think of an, uh, of, of an agency as being a consensual arrangement that has to be consciously regarded by the parties to the agency. Um, so when this assignment uh, or transfer of the lender's interest occurs to a successor, there's obviously an opportunity, as you've just described it, to revisit that. But under what principle of law does, in the absence of some revocation uh, by the successor, does the agency persist? I'm not sure about that. Can you help me? Is it just because MERS is the designated beneficiary and presumptively travels with the papers? Not so much presumptively travels, but I, I think I can approach it three different ways. Uh, partly, I think one needs to keep separate the concept of MERS as the beneficiary and MERS as the agent of the lender. They are both, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to be controlled by the same agreements. So, for example, the trust deed says that MERS is the beneficiary for the lender and whoever the lender assigns, uh, or excuse me, whoever the successor of the lender's interest is. So as the trust deed travels, it says in it, MERS continues as the beneficiary for the new lender. MERS also has, by virtue of the agreement in the trust deed, legal title to the interests that the security instrument represents. And so separate and apart from a statement that the beneficiary travels to the successor by virtue of having legal title, MERS as the beneficiary would also transfer. This now, the, only works, right, because MERS has, if MERS has an agreement with the new with the transferee, right, such that MERS is now the agent of this new principal. Your Honor, you were getting to the third prong of my argument, which is, and in addition to the rights or the obligations, the status of the beneficiary under the trust deed as holder of legal title, as recipient of a statement that says you go with this trustee to the successor, there is also an agency agreement between the lender and MERS. If the transfer that happens goes to another member of MERS, there is a second agency agreement already in place that says our agency, in addition to our position as beneficiary, moves from the transferor to the transferee. If there weren't there, the beneficial, beneficiary's role would change because of the legal title and because of the designation of the trust deed, but the agency relationship might not, and the new person might very well say, you're gone. We choose to change you now because we don't have an agency re relationship with you and we don't want one. In the very little time that I have left, uh, at least in my direct comments, let me try briefly to address the issue that Justice Kistler had, which is who benefits by these assignments? The major beneficiary, small b, not big B, as if we're using in the statute, of the assignments is the trustee. It is not, these assignments are not put in the record for the benefit of borrowers. They are not in exchange for the ease of foreclosure that comes with the Trust Deed Act. ORS 86.735 and ORS 86.745 provide for the trustee to give the borrower, the grantor, the information first with a notice of default, how much you owe, who much you pay to get out of the problem. If there isn't a payment, then the trustee gives a notice to the borrower saying, this is how much you owe, 
this is who you owe it to, and this is how you get out of this problem. The borrower is getting all of the information needed right there. ORS 86.080 is also important to this analysis. That statute says that an assignment of a mortgage in the land records is not, not notice to the debtor, the borrower, the grantor. If there is an assignment and the borrower pays the original lender instead of the subsequent lender, that's okay. It's up to the original lender to transfer the payment, and I will save the rest of my comments for rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barnes. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the Court, Jeff Barnes, Pro Hoc Vice for Respondent Rebecca Nide. I like to begin my presentation by saying that I sat through Mr. Chamov's presentation this morning. I sat through it this afternoon. I've listened carefully to the questions of the court, and I've listened carefully to what he said. And at least at this point, I don't understand what MERS's role, MERS's capacity, MERS's interest is. I've heard Mr. Chamov say they're a beneficiary. I've heard him say that they're an agent. I've heard him say that they're a nominee agent. I've heard somebody this morning, I think it was Justice Kistler, who termed it Agency Plus. I don't know what it is. It has not been made clear. But what is made clear, and, and it seems like the argument on this side of the table anyway, has been straying away from what this case is really all about. What this case is about is applying the levels, I'm sorry, applying the principles of statutory construction and interpretation in Oregon, including the case law and ORS 174.010, to analyzing these two statutes. And nobody's really talked about that. And what MERS is trying to do here, MERS being a creation of private industry roughly 30 years after the Trustee Act was enacted in 1959, when MERS couldn't have even been contemplated by the legislature, is that this private industry electronic tracking entity, which does nothing more than that, does not own promissory notes, does not extend credit, does not loan money, does not collect money, does not function as a servicer, all of a sudden is claiming, on the one hand, in one part of the trustee, to be only solely a nominee, which, as several of the justices have said, is a very, very narrow legal capacity with defined limits. But yet, turning around in the next clause or the next series of, of provisions in the trustee and saying, oh, no, no, we're more than that. We're the beneficiary, and we can foreclose, and we can do all these other things. Well, it's, it's not both. It's one or the other. And I think Justice Brewer hit on this this morning, if I can reference what happened this morning. If you apply the principles of Oregon case law, which talk about how the courts are to uh, construe a statutory provision, the rules of construction, which came out in the PGE and the Gaines case, you've got to look at the plain meaning of the statute, and you only resort to all these other outside sources, like the references that have been made in Merz's brief to statutes from other jurisdictions and from other periods of time, the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and other parts of the Oregon statutes to try to understand what's going on. If that plain, natural, and ordinary language and meaning and context of that is not answered, but it is answered by taking that total clause. There are not two independent clauses that we said in our brief. They are dependent clauses that have to be read in peri materia. The trust deed is essentially a security instrument that's given for the, it, it is an instrument created, and it's created for the benefit of the person who provided the ability to do the transaction in the first place. Now, is it the lender? Maybe. Maybe the lender is somebody like a person who's wealthy and who is dying or who wants his kids to have the benefit, and that person is designated in the trust deed. But looking at the 27 clauses in this particular trustee that talk about protecting the lender and making sure that the lender has protection, that's how we have to analyze it. And the scorecard is 27 to 3 on this trustee, 
27 in favor of the lender, three in favor of MERS, maybe, if we can figure out what MERS's interest is. I hate to interrupt you, but let's just oh, assume that um, what focus for me, if you would, on let's just assume that MERS can be an agent of the lender and as an agent can be named as the beneficiary. Is there anything, where does the statute take us from there? Let's just assume that, that they can be named as a beneficiary. Game over, or do you have some additional arguments? Well, again, um, I think this is the tack that MERS is trying to take, is they're trying to isolate that portion of the statute. Well, we assume that, that lenders can have agents. Of course. I mean, of course. Okay, so what's your next argument? Let's say that all they are is named in there as the agent of the, of, of the lender. Then what does that tell us about the application of 86735? What it tells us is, is that that agency relationship has to be evaluated in terms of what is the scope of the agency, which is where the nominee designation comes in. Remember, the nominee designation is right up front. That's the title that MERS chose to put upon itself immediately. So that pervades every successive relationship that they have, whoever downline. Meaning what? Meaning that, as Mr. and I will agree with Mr. Chamoff on this, at best, at best, MERS holds only bare legal title. Bare legal title to what? To a contract? Well, it's, it's more, as Justice Brewer talked about this morning, it's, it's kind of like a Bailey custodial concept. What MERS essentially does is provides a service. And the service is when someone tells them to do something, to draft an assignment, to transfer some documents, to do whatever, they do that. They provide that service. Okay. Now, the bare legal title thing, you know, I, I hold bare legal title to this. I'm the custodian. I hold on to it. I don't own it. I have no ownership rights in it. This is the note of the deed of trust. The, the person directing me, if we're going on an agency concept, the principal is going to tell me, the custodian, the bailey, what to do with it. Okay. And what does that tell us about whether you have to record an assignment that the principal makes or that MERS makes? Well, th that's a question you brought up this morning, and I, I wanted to answer it. Because what you said was, and if I recall your hypothetical correctly, if the lender transfers its interest to somebody else, what is that and what does that require? Well, again, the lender is the beneficiary, the real beneficiary in that instance. The lender is the principal. So in that instance, it is a transfer, which is also a form of assignment. Again, remember... But what if everybody has agreed that the beneficiary is MERS and the statute says any assignments by the beneficiary? They have to be recorded. Because but MERS... That, because but it MERS, doesn't work? It doesn't work to, de to identify... And see, we're getting back to what we're trying to get to, Frank, because we talked about it a lot this morning, and our goal is not to, not to figure out everything today, but to get information from you folks so we can figure it out later. Uh, and we've talked a lot about the first question, which is can uh, MERS be a beneficiary? And, uh, and you started off with that, and that's fine. But we'd like to you know, move on to the other questions, where if you assume, and I'm, not that we're deciding this by any means, but if they are right on that issue, what does that mean? And in particular, how, how does the transfer and the recordation requ requirement apply uh, once you sort of get into uh, assignments or transfers of some interest in the note and or the trustee? Well, it depends on how, what happens with a particular transaction. For example, sure. if MERS, for example, was the be-all and end-all, if MERS was the beneficiary who loaned the money, collected the money, was owed the money, there are no assignments. Then the second, the seven, you know, 735 doesn't even kick in. However, what happens in the real world is that MERS does assign out. And there are situations where MERS will assign out to a party who will assign back to MERS, and MERS will assign it to somebody else. And this goes on all the time, all over the country. So in that instance, every time that interest is transferred by MERS as nominee for uh, Delta funding or Greenpoint or wherever it might be, or, you know, that has to be recorded under our statute because the statute doesn't define an assignment, doesn't restrict it to being a written assignment, and any is any. Plain and common sense meaning under rules of statutory construction is any and all. And 174.010 says you can't add words to a statute or omit... I think they said that if that 
MERS, once their appointed beneficiary, just sits there and is beneficiary for everybody in the chain of title. So MERS is not making any transfers at all. The transfers are happening at the principal level, but each principal has appointed MERS the beneficiary. So MERS is not transferring anything. Well, okay, I, I know what I, I know what your what your concern is here, because this has come up before. MERS, right, MERS is not actually physically doing the transferring. The transfer occurs between the transfer or and the transferee. Um, Bank of America to U.S. Bank as trustee for the certificate holders of whatever. Uh, that I understand. MERS provides a function as a servicing type entity, like a litigation support entity, which actually crafts the assignment document that has to be recorded, which memorializes the transfer. That's essentially what they're doing. Remember, MERS was created for the purpose of tracking transfers in mortgage loans. All right, That's all they do. And in the case law around the country, they disclaimed all these other responsibilities. They said, no, no, no. We do basically one thing. We electronically track the transfer of mortgage loans. That, they do more than that. We know that. But what that assignment that they make, a MERS assignment, is the memorialization of a transfer between entity A and entity B. That's what they do. That's their function. And I don't want to undercut your argument. Does your argument on the transfer of the assignment and recordation depend on your view that MERS can't be the beneficiary because as an agent they have to act, exercise greater powers than an agent would have? Well, are you talking about in a general sense or under the statute? Under the statute. I mean, in other words, I mean, I, I'm trying to think, in other words, Murr's argument, if I'm understanding it, is internally consistent. We're the beneficiary. Everything else goes underneath the surface. We're not making an assignment. Therefore, there's nothing to record. Your argument in response, is it got to be that they're not the beneficiary and therefore they have to record? And I, and I, and I, and I don't mean to get you back into the issue that you were trying to, that Justice Walters was trying to get you off, no, I, but, 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 but I, I'm trying to figure out why you think the recordation there, doesn't work if they're it, right on beneficiary. It does. There's a body of case law that explains this, and it's in our, our brief in the Court of Appeals case. What happens is that the MERS is appointed as the beneficiary in a deed of trust or a mortgage document for purposes of facilitating the transfer. That's the raison d'etre, for, you, you know, for lack of a better word, that, that why that they exist and why they're so named as the beneficiary, because statutory schemes say that, for example, assignments by the beneficiary or the trustee are the ones that have to be recorded. So since MERS is neither, unless they claim themselves to be, they are either self-appointed or appointed by the lender to be the beneficiary for that purpose, again, truncated by the nominee designation. It's a specific type of beneficiary, which I know Justice Brewer was concerned about this multiple beneficiary thing, and, and I get that. The true beneficiary under the two statutes we're dealing with, obviously, is the lender. There can be other title beneficiaries, I guess is the, the word I'm looking for, that serve a specific function in these type of transactions. And this body of case law talks about that and why MERS is named as the beneficiary, so that they can do they, they can record these transfers, they can memorialize these transfers, they can record these assignments. They can physically do those things, which again are services provided to somebody else. I think what you're saying is in 86.735 when it says what has to be recorded in the real property records in Oregon is assignments by the person to whom the obligation is owed. They have to be recorded by them? Well, no, that, that their assignments are the ones that have to be recorded, not the MERS assignments. But MERS assignments are memorializations of transfers between two entities. Okay. MERS is nominee example, for, for example, for uh, you know, BNC mortgage to uh, Deutsche Bank as trustee for so-and-so. You say they keep track of that somewhere. Exactly. You're not saying they're recorded in the Oregon real property records. You're saying they keep track of that. Well, they do, but the thing is, because that is a that transfer is a form of assignment, it's one of the any assignments under the statute, uh -huh. it does have to be recorded. Okay, so you're saying that when MERS keeps track of who owns a note, that that is 
they are making a transfer by keeping track of that? No. What I'm saying is that MERS is essentially relegated to the function of memorializing the transfer in an assignment document of whatever source, whether it be a transfer by endorsement or a, a flat-out assignment or corporate assignment of deed of trust or whatever the, the document might be called. What they do is memorialize it, and as the beneficiary for this purpose, they satisfy the recording requirement. They're not making the transfer. They're memorializing it and recording it to comply with the statute. That's what they're doing. I, I was, if I was obtuse, I'll, I'll try to explain it. Well, at least for me, I'm not, I'm not quite sure I'm getting it, and I'm trying, I'm really trying to, I want to understand. Okay. Well, I mean, I take, are you saying that it's fact that MERS really isn't the one, that there's a, there, there are assignments going on that aren't being recorded, and in MERS, those things should be recorded under uh, Oregon statute? Well, under the Oregon statute, any transfer should be recorded. Okay, okay. And, and there's, there are reasons for that. There are public policy reasons for that. And, and it, also, it, remember, I, I think it was brought out this morning, the non-judicial foreclosure statute is a harsh remedy where you are time trying to usurp someone's property right. It's a strict compliance statute. Yeah. It's like a penal statute. It has to be strictly construed. There's no such thing as substantial compliance. So if the statute says you have to do it, you have to do it. There are no excuses. There are no exceptions. So, so help, 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 help me understand why the system that MERS has in place isn't adequate to protect the bar's interest and the trustee's interest. Because, well, because, because it, 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 I'm just trying, I, I want to understand the public policy reasons that they require something more than they're doing. Well, Justice Kissel, that presumes that your conception of what MERS does and my conception are the same. I'm not so sure that they are. Well, well, when you say the MERS, system that, the MERS system that MERS has in place. Yeah. In other words, where they say, look, we're recorded as a beneficiary. That's, this is what I understand them say. We're recorded as a beneficiary. We're not transferring anything, so there's no assignment by a beneficiary. We're doing everything that has to be done. And you say, no, there's something more that should be done, and if I understood you right, violates the public policy interest of having a recordation system. I'm trying to understand what, 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 what no, is it. In, what, I, what I'm saying is, and, and it strikes me as odd, that why MERS, which is an entity that was created specifically for the purpose of tracking transfers in mortgage loans throughout the country, would have such a problem and put up a vociferous fight to comply with a simple recording statute? Why? I, I don't understand that. And they are the entity who is in the best position to do that. If, as Mr. Chamoff said. Justice Kister is asking you for the public policy reasons, because we're talking about public, you're talking okay. about public policy here, for, for the reason that uh, there are important public policies that are being undercut by the failure to record. There are two that I can think of okay. off the top of my head. The, fir the first one is the one that um, was brought out this morning to protect subject subsequent purchasers. But the second one is title companies aren't going to issue title insurance unless there is an accurate chain of title that come up in the B-2 exceptions on a title report. And the only way they find that out is going into the public records and finding and out what... Title insurance companies been issuing uh, titles uh, or title insurance policies uh, since MERS has been around? Yeah, but they've stopped doing that since the nine day decision, and they've stopped doing that since all the MERS problems. <laughs> That's a totally circular argument. That well, no, not really, because what they're saying is, wait a minute, we're a title insurance company. We're an insurance company. We have to do a risk analysis. We have to do underwriting. We have to analyze the risk. How can we analyze the risk and write a title policy when we don't know what the variables are? An unrecorded assignment is an unknown variable. How can they insure against an unknown variable? They can't. That's the problem. So anybody who acquires a property... Why are the title insurance companies in here on the other side? I'm sorry? Why are the title insurance companies on the other side of this case? I, frankly, I have no idea. So, Mr. Barnes, um, there seems to be, at least if I'm under tracking the arguments uh, accurately, uh, at least some difference of opinion uh, among the parties as to what the nature of this nomination really is. Mm -hmm. You've given us a very nice historical description of your understanding of the purpose of MERS and what it does. And I'd like to take us back to the contract for a moment, which is the trust deed in this case. And I'm looking at uh, ER 5657, which are, it contain at least two of the three references to MERS mm -hmm. that you've talked about. And it's kind of interesting. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure how this cuts, and that's why I'm asking the question, and maybe to Mr. Chamon. 
that it talks about the nominee status. Um, and it talks about MERS being the beneficiary and being a separate corporation, but it never really discusses in any explicit detail what the scope of the nomination is. You've got a narrative. Mr. Chamoff's got a narrative. How does this court decide, either from the four corners of this instrument or based on other contract principles, what the facts on the ground really are? Well, let's take it from the back forward. So let's talk about contract principles first, which goes to what you were talking about this morning. And what I, what I was kind of thinking when you made your comments was that you were really talking and going towards a consideration principle from contract law. It, basically, the trustee is granted as consideration for the lender lending the money to acquire the property. That's, that's simple. Now, but taking that, what consideration has MERS provided? Zero. So that cuts against MERS. If you look at MERS's solely as nominee designation, solely as nominee, that means nothing else. Solely means only that. It doesn't mean agent. It doesn't mean beneficiary. It doesn't mean power of attorney. And again, there's a body of case law in our Court of Appeals brief that discusses why that language is significant. It's significant because it limits what MERS can do so that MERS cannot be a beneficiary under any circumstances. So you're, you're, you're again, my words, your, your notion, I want to just check on this, is at one level your position is that the nomination is devoid of substance. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say, wrong? I wouldn't say it's devoid of substance. I would say the nomination strict, really, really severely restricts what MERS is and what MERS can do. So what can MERS do based on the four corners of the instrument or some other contract principle? What I said before, MERS can function in a beneficiary capacity solely for the purpose of executing and recording assignment documents and tracking transfers. That's it. Even though there's nothing in the trustee that refers to those things? Well, there's nothing in the trustee that says that MERS can do all the things that Mr. Chamoff said either. That's why I'm asking. So we have to go with the language, we have to go with the interpretation of those uh, characteristic traits, such as solely as nominee, under the case law. And it's, and frankly, Oregon hasn't gotten this far yet with this area of the law, where they've dissected these principles and these terms and analyzed them in connection with the statute. Different states in the country at different levels of this stuff. MERS is, is the MERS issues really haven't been cut and diced and dissected here as they have in other states. Can you talk for a minute about why assignment includes endorsement as well as um, other written forms of assignment? Because the statute doesn't say, oh, and by the way, it only refers to written assignments and endorsements in blank don't count. Any means any. Rules of statutory construction, plain and ordinary meaning of any is any, any form. I, I just I want to take you back for one second. I do want to be fair. At ER 57, of course, and I'd ask you to focus on this for a minute, there is some specific content to um, MERS responsibilities here. It does say uh, that MERS holds legal title. That reference exists in the document to the interest granted by borrower in the security interest. And then it says, but if necessary to comply with law or custom, MERS as nominee has the right to exercise any and all of those interests, including but not limited to the right to foreclose and sell and take any action required of lenders. So clearly the concept of enforcement is included, but it's not really narrowed uh, to just that. So uh, anticipating Mr. Chamoff's response to my question and your answer, why isn't that broad enough to make MERS a beneficiary by proxy? Well, again, you've got the qualifier right up front, if necessary to comply with law or custom. What law is necessary to comply with in order to make MERS a full beneficiary? None. And they've cited none. What custom is necessary to comply with in order to make MERS a full beneficiary with the power to foreclose? None. And there's a clause, again, I don't mean to dominate this, just in front of the if necessary to comply with law or custom provision that, again, refers to MERS holding legal title to the interests. And I take it it's your view, again, that that legal title alone isn't sufficient to qualify <coughs> it as a beneficiary under the statute irrespective of the law and custom language. Right, under this statute, under this specific non-judicial foreclosure statute, which is a strict compliance statute, absolutely, in this narrow circumstance. And that's, 
And that's where this, I see that this thing has strayed since this morning. It's gone way outside of what we're really talking about here. All of this analysis relates to this specific remedy. It doesn't relate to, as they said in some of their briefs, you know, discharging a trustee or satisfying a mortgage or anything like that. We're talking about this specific statute, this non-judicial foreclosure statute, which is an extraordinary remedy requiring strict compliance. For purposes of that statute, no, MERS is not a beneficiary. It doesn't qualify under the statutory language. It doesn't make sense under the trustee. I would just like to take a few minutes to address some of the other points that Mr. Chamoff made, unless the court has some questions. Because I'm still on the green light. I haven't seen the caution light You're yet. You're fine. Thank you. Um, first, Mr. Chamoff talked about cases that the court would like the court to consider. Um, the Jackson case, this case is used a lot by the, um, I guess, the foreclosing party bar around the country to say that MERS is the be all and end all and can do whatever it wants. Jackson was decided on a recording issue. A close reading of Jackson shows that the only issue in Jackson was can MERS record assignments? The answer was yes. It didn't say whether the substance of the assignments could be attacked. It didn't say whether by recording them the assignments were valid. All it said was MERS could, could record assignments. The Nevada case, the Edelstein case, was decided in the context of the Nevada mediation statutes. It has nothing to do with what we're doing here. Uh, the the um, O'Banion v. SPS case from Idaho, frankly, I haven't read yet. And the citation to the last case, 2011 Westlaw 705617, there was no case name given. So, again, I don't know, other than the argument that Idaho's statute is substantially similar to Oregon's, uh, what that has on the bearing it has on this case. I, I have a different take on this. And I think there are at least three cases, if I may proffer those to the court, that I think the court should read to understand, or the court may want to read, I'm sorry, that the court may want to read to understand what's going on in the context of what we're talking about. And that's the Southwest Homes of Arkansas case, which has a statute similar to Oregon's, the Nebraska Department of Banking and Finance case, where MERS's counsel in front of the Nebraska Supreme Court made a series of disclaimers as to what MERS is not, does not, and cannot do, and also the Kansas case, which is cited in our brief. The problem, again, with this area of the law is that there is no one decision out there that touches on all the MERS issues. The closest one that I found was the trial court opinion from Vermont that we cited in our, in our uh, Court of Appeals brief. But again, that's a trial court opinion. <clears throat> but the benefit of that is it's, like a, it's sort of like a treatise. It takes the reader through all of these decisions from these other courts, from Kansas, from Arkansas, from Nebraska, from Nevada, from Idaho. And at the end of the day, says, looking at all these decisions around the country on this issue and this issue and this issue, we can now paint the picture. We now know what MERS is. We now know what it can do, what it cannot do, and what its restrictions are, despite what it may say in a trustee or a mortgage document. So that, that's kind of a nice little primer on that. But I think the three biggest cases are the Kansas, Nebraska, and Arkansas cases. And I would uh, request that the court, if they're going to look at cases from Mr. Chamoff's suggestion, they would uh, grant us the same courtesy. Mr. Chamoff made an argument that if the trustee, that the um, MERS holds legal title. Well, in a deed of trust transaction, the trustee at the closing, who's usually the title company, they're the ones that hold legal title. Well, if MERS, if we accept his position that MERS holds legal title, the trustee and MERS can't both hold legal title. To what? Right. What does the trustee hold legal title to? Trustee holds legal, bare legal title to the trust document. To the, to the trust trustee. To the trustee. And to the note. That depends on how you interpret what's going on. If you go with one of these note follows the, uh, the deed of trust follows the note theories, then arguably, yes. But re in reality, the lender holds both legal and equitable title to the note. What the, what the trustee basically is, the, close, the title company is, is basically, a again, a custodian who holds it until there is a foreclosure. And there's a substitution of trustee because title companies don't do foreclosures. And they substitute out that trustee and they put in a Northwest Trustee Services or Executive Trustee Services, one of these third-party trustee sale companies, and they do the foreclosure. 
Now, but if you accept Mr. Chamos' argument that MERS is the one that holds legal title and the trustee doesn't, well, then the trustee holds nothing to trustees out of the picture. And guess what? We don't have a deed of trust. We have a mortgage. Trustees' function is eviscerated completely, if you accept his argument. And I see him on my caution light. Uh, how much time do I have? Left? Two minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so you don't agree that MERS holds bare legal title when they're the nominee? Here's how I think it works. The trustee at the time of closing, which is the title company, holds the bare legal title at that point. At the point where there is a necessity for SMERS to do something, whether it's to do a substitution of trustee as a beneficiary or record an assignment, that then transfers from the, original, from the trustee because one of the things that MERS does as the beneficiary is to substitute the trustee. So it... Are they acting on behalf of a principal when they do that? Well, I, and see, that's, that's part of the, argue, the problem I have with this agency theory is that under the law of this court, if you look at the, the dichotomy between what real agency is and what a service provider is, MERS is a service provider. They're not an agent. So what they're really doing is providing a service. They're, they're, they're not a true agent in the agency well, no, sense. No, no, no. An agent can have a, a, a lot, you know, there, you have a general agent that has all sorts of powers. You can have very narrow powers in agency. And the True. that somebody is an agent or not, as a legal matter, doesn't begin to answer the question of what the scope of the agency is. is Correct. And the scope of the agency is defined by the limiting language in the trustee. Solely as nominee beneficiary. A nominee beneficiary only does certain things. They chose that title. They did not choose agent. They did not choose power of attorney. They chose nominee. Yeah, I wonder what, uh, whether the... Uh, whether there are other documents one would have to look at, such as the relationship between MERS and the, and I'm just thinking out loud here, sure. uh, MERS and the banks for which it purports to be an agent. Uh, you know, certainly the, you know, the certain trust responsibilities uh, or beneficiary responsibilities may be determined by statute or the deed of trust or the related closing documents, but the relationship between MERS as an entity and the financial institutions may well depend upon agreements that they have with each other well, and the real, in the, these documents. And a really interesting scenario is when MERS does a, what we call a MERS assignment in my, in my world, where they purport to assign the interest in a deed of trust or a mortgage document together with the note, which they never owned in the first place, on behalf of a bankrupt entity or an entity that's out of business. Mm -hmm. How do they do that? Well, there's certain cases, there's certain courts that have tackled that, and they said, guess what, it doesn't happen. And again, I know that's law from other jurisdictions, but it doesn't. Because again, consulting the outside sources, for example, authority of the bankruptcy court to allow that to happen, uh, whether somebody was a surviving director of the out-of-business out of lender who had the authority to grant MERS the authority to transfer, who knows? Plenty of litigation to go around. That's the quandary. Yeah. But, Construing the statute the way the Court of Appeals did eliminates a lot of this. And our, posi Clark. our position is that the Court of Appeals opinion should be affirmed in its entirety. I'm sorry, its entirety. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jamar? Well, my intention in rebuttal is to talk briefly about two points. Uh, first, uh, to uh, apologize for omitting the name of the second Idaho case, which is Washburn versus Bank of America. Uh, the second, before I move into what will be uh, the bulk of the comments, uh, is to respond to the statement that the assignments of trustee are to protect subsequent purchasers. Subsequent purchasers do not need protection from assignments. ORS 86.780 provides that the trustee's deed, the representations in that deed, are conclusive as to a BFP. That's where the protection for purchasers uh, comes in in the Oregon Trust Deed Act. The bulk of uh, the comments I'd like to provide to you on rebuttal deal with the relationship of MERS in these transactions. 
the interests that it holds, uh, hopefully being able to uh, clarify uh, some of the concerns that Justice Brewer has. To begin with, the trustee in Oregon does not hold legal title to the property or anything. The statute, when originally drafted, did provide that the trustee held legal title to the property. That title was eliminated roughly 20 years ago. Now, the trustee's power is the power of sale. There are specific statutory <clears throat> rights and obligations given to the trustee, but they do not include holding any kind of legal title. The entity that holds a legal title that is of significance in this case is MERS. The legal title that MERS holds is to the rights, the interests that the borrowers granted to the lender in the security instrument. Not saying it's the legal title to the property, the borrower has that. But the legal title to the interests granted by the borrower to the lender in this case are with MERS. That legal title in and of itself allows MERS to exercise all of the rights that accrue to the lender in this case. If MERS won this, Mr. Let me, so I understood Mr. Barnes, he disagreed with you on this, that point. How do we know that your, your view is right, that, you, that the, uh, the beneficiary holds legal title, or MERS holds legal the title to the beneficiary's interest? Because that's what the trustee, the trustee says. says. Okay. Uh, and, and, but I, if I understood Mr. Barnes, he said that's an impossibility or that simply doesn't work, things don't work that way. If you do it that way, it turns into a mortgage. Um, and I could be misremembering him, but I just wanted to know if you help me straighten out the disagreement, if there is one between you and him, I'd appreciate it. I'm afraid the only way that I can clarify the agreement is to say that the contract means what the contract says. The rights that the parties into this agreement granted was legal title to MERS, and it's not some other or different right. Um, you know, if uh, we can find anything in additional authorities that would bear on that question, we'd be pleased to provide it, but... What are the interests that the borrowers granted to the lender? It includes the right to foreclose, it includes the right to collect payments, it includes everything that was granted in the 27 references to the lender to which Mr. Barnes referred. So if the note is transferred, by the lender, these the right to foreclose and the right to collect payment do not go with the note. As, as holder of legal title, MERS can exercise all of those rights. If those rights are then, however, transferred to someone else, MERS takes with it, they can still do it for the successor. But I'm just, okay. It, if MERS is sitting there on day one holding the right to foreclose and the right to collect payment because they got that in the trust deed. Yes. Can the owner of the note, who I assume also has the right to collect payment on that note, yes. transfer, is that called a legal title? No, the, the lender in this case would have an equitable or a beneficial interest or title if you the, choose to. Because the lender is granted that right in the trust deed. And in the note, yes. Okay. So the lender still keeps that right? The lender is ultimately in, in, in power. Okay. In part because of and the And the lender then transfers that right to somebody else? The, the lender, yes. Okay. Then you're saying MERS has also kept it even though the lender who had it transferred it? Yes, Your Honor, because whatever the lender transfers transfers MERS rights along with it. And, and is this your point that at least in your view everyone's in the MERS system so that if you transfer it among members within the MERS system they continue MERS role whereas if you transfer it to a bank that's outside of it it doesn't or may not? It may not. But yes, you, you would say presumably that because of the way the documents are phrased it applies to the transferee from the original lender 
right? MERS is still the beneficiary. They still are the one that's going to exercise these rights on your behalf. Yes, Your Honor. Now, if that, is a, if that transferee is not a MERS member, they might want to tell MERS to sort of have somebody else be the beneficiary or the trustee. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. To use an analogy that Ms. French came up with uh, during the interim between the arguments, if you conceive of the transaction as a birthday cake, MERS is the candles, and if you pass the birthday cake to someone else, the candles go with the cake, but the person who gets the cake can take the candles off. But, and also the person who gets the cake, the transferee, acquires the right to foreclose and the right to collect payment. Absolutely. Okay. So I, I just want to cover one argument that I know is addressed in the briefs, but I think would be helpful uh, to hear your, your response to this. Your opponent argues that your legal title claim only carries you so far. That unless you get to this law and custom piece, that the other rights that you're concerned about, including the right to foreclose, don't arise. So it seems to me that legal title doesn't, as you, as MERS has, 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 uh, has described it in the trustee itself, doesn't include the right to foreclose unless it's necessary based on law and custom. They argue that that isn't the case. You disagree. Just tell us why law and custom requires it here. The, the law and custom clause, which is what you're referring to, is really uh, what I guess you would refer to as belts and suspenders. Because MERS has legal title to the interest under the security instrument, and because MERS is the agent for the principal, and an agent can do anything that the principal can, MERS has the right, independent of what I'm calling the law and custom clause, to take any action the lender can under the security agreement. The law and custom clause is there for the circumstance in which there would be the law of a state where the law was these actions cannot be taken by an agent. I'm sorry. By itself, in and of itself, the agent cannot be acting in its own right. In that case, MERS can take those actions on behalf of the lender as the agent for the lender. So by holding legal title, MERS has independent rights to enforce the trust deed by virtue of the law and custom clause, if that were not the case under the law of the state, then MERS would at least be able to fall back and take those actions under its agency relationship with the lender. Thank you very much. We ask you to re reverse the Court of Appeals. Thank you, Mr. Chamoff, Mr. Barnes. Thank you very much. Court will be in recess. Your Honor, um, just a, a one housekeeping matter. I'm sorry. Yep. You mentioned at, at the very beginning that this, the supplemental authorities was filed right. in our case. Yes. You mentioned this morning there was an opportunity to respond if necessary. Absolutely. Yes, you have 10 days to file a response. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt yep. you. No, that's fine. That's fine. The case is submitted. We'll be in recess.